Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. It's another edition of E-Waste Wednesday on the Retro Hack Shack After Hours, my second channel. So stay tuned because we're gonna take a look at these two Macintosh classics that I just found at E-Waste. It's coming up right now on Retro Hack Shack After Hours. Well, like I said, this is another edition of E-Waste Wednesday. That's about where the logo goes, right in there somewhere. And uh, yeah, this is where I go to E-Waste on Wednesdays. You might not be watching this on Wednesday, but it's Wednesday for me. Uh, I go to E-Waste and my E-Waste place is very generous. Find lots of great stuff there, as you know, if you've been watching my channel. If you haven't been, by the way, and you like to see treasures like this discovered, please uh, subscribe to not only this channel, but my main channel. And I would really appreciate it especially this channel, as this channel is new and is still grow going, and I've moved all of my E-Waste Wednesday content over to here because it tends to be less scripted and, you know, I might not edit it quite as carefully as some other things, but still really interesting content like these two Macintosh classics that we're going to break into today and see if they're still running. So with all that said, we're going to take a look at these today, and then at the end, I will try to remember to tell you what I paid for these. <laughs> Sometimes I don't always remember, but I will try to remember to tell you what I paid for these at the end, so stay tuned for that. All right, let's go ahead and crack these open. As I said, I got these at eWaste, and they were just sitting there on a cart, and I'm not sure, you know, didn't turn them on there, of course. This must, might be a complete waste of time. Don't know, but I've got my extended screwdriver. This is even bigger than you need. This is a 12 inch uh, Torque 15 screwdriver, T15, if you're playing along at home. And this is the screwdriver you will need to get into these Macintoshes, the classic Macs, because they have screws up here at the top that are really hard to reach. Even if you got a, a, a T15, screwdriver off of Amazon, the typical one isn't going to be long enough to reach all the way in to get these screws out. So you do need to have this, although you don't necessarily need one this long. This was just a cheap set I got from Amazon, and they're really long for automotive use, for, for people that really have to get down around engines and things like that. Uh, so yeah, I would say you need one that's at least eight inches, probably 10 inches long. This one just happens to be extra long. So it's a little comical, comically long, in fact. So the Macintosh Classic, I believe, was released in 1990. So, you know, for me, that's still vintage. As I'm taping this, that would make them 33, 34 years old, probably 33. I'm sure they probably weren't released in January. Um, and so, yeah, these things are, are vintage and old and should have this, this on the older Macs. This was a battery compartment, but I don't think it is on the Mac Classic. I think it's used for something else. We'll find out in a minute if I can get in there. And I'm just noticing, especially this one, this one's already open. The back is definitely attached. I'm wondering if maybe this is a case of they didn't know that there were screws up in here. Sorry for my head getting in the way. No, I don't see any, I don't see any screws in here. It can be hard to tell, but there's no screws on this one. Yeah, there's no screws on this one either. I'm wondering if whoever dropped these off maybe opened these up and took the hard drives out. The last that time that happened on my channels, the whoever got in there totally uh, screwed up everything on the inside. They didn't just take the hard drive out. They didn't know how to take the hard drive out or how to open up the Macs. Almost completely destroyed them and they're sitting over there and I'm gonna do a follow-up video where I restore those. But yeah, I hope they didn't damage the insides of these because you can easily replace a hard drive in these. But yeah, do, undoing the damage that was done on those other ones that I had uh, is going to take a lot of work actually for me to get those up and running again. Because they cut through, they got through the wires, you know, that go to the uh, analog board. I mean, they really trash those things. But these don't look like they have any screws in them. So let me see if I can uh, just pull these apart. Let's start with this one that's already open a little bit and see if I can pull this off. Usually if you just give it a good yank, it'll come up. Aha, there we go. Also the floppy drive is still intact and the power from the analog board is still here. 
The only thing I can tell for sure is that it is missing a SCSI cable, which I can go grab one of those and we can test this out. But these classics and most of the Macs around this time period are known for having pretty bad capacitor problems. So, you know, that could be an issue here. Let's just pull this board out and see, since everything's already disconnected, and see what the, uh, see what the capacitors look like on it. Well, here's the motherboard, and I've got to say, it's a pretty clean motherboard, and there's no battery in it, so somebody has, you know, taken the time to take the battery out, and I don't see any leakage in the caps. I'll go over this a bit more, but the caps all look okay, so I'm really confused as to how this thing ended up at e-waste. I mean, I guess if somebody just didn't want it anymore, that's... That's one thing to do with it, but I would have thought they would have at least tried to sell it or something. Um, but yeah, let me, let's me let hook this thing up and see if it boots up. Maybe it's a perfectly working Macintosh. Okay, well, I've hooked everything back up, but I found a SCSI cable for this thing. I'm really curious to see if this thing's just going to work. Um, now, I should have mentioned as I was taking this apart that uh, since this is a CRT, you really should be careful. If you know watch this channel, you, you know that I give these warnings because... It's very easy to electrocute yourself, give yourself a really nasty shock with these CRTs that sometimes hold charges, things are exposed. Mains voltages are also somewhat exposed inside this chassis. So if you don't know what you're doing electrically, then it's probably best just to leave this alone until you get some experience. The best way to do that is to ask a friend or go to your local makerspace or something like that. People that know how to deal with these things and ask them for some help. And pretty soon you'll be uh, able to take precautions like a champion. So I'm going to go ahead and plug this in now and we'll see what in the world is going on with this Mac. Here we go. Power's on, no high voltage. Let me make sure this cable is actually plugged in. No, I'm getting nothing on this thing. What's going on here? Yeah, no power, no power whatsoever, no high voltage. I thought I was hearing the fan, but I'm hearing my 3D printer that's printing in the background over there. If you're hearing that in the background and it's annoying, I apologize. I don't think you can hear it though too much through this mic. But yeah, there's nothing. So now we need to do a little bit of digging here to see what's going on. All right, so let me just carefully check the uh, the main fuse here, just to make sure it's not blown. Nope. That fuse is fine. So there must be something else going on. I will say that overall, this everything in here is very, very clean. I think I'm going to have to take the uh, analog board off and have a quick look at it. Well, I went over the whole analog board and I really didn't see anything wrong. Nothing was, no caps were leaking, nothing was out of place, nothing was burnt, the fuse wasn't blown. I've put on the protective shield here on this side just temporarily with a couple of the, the things here so that I'm not going to shock myself by accident. I don't know, could it have just been a bad connection or... I'm not exactly sure what's going on. Everything is, everything's tight. Everything's plugged in. It's really weird. Let's try it again. I'm going to turn it on again. No high voltage. Uh, I did notice that the speaker wasn't plugged in, so I hooked up some external speakers, hoping to maybe hear a gong, but there's nothing. Nothing doing. So I guess that's why they brought this in, was it's really just not working. Yeah, the hard drive's not spinning up. I'm not seeing any voltage here at all. I'm just going to test the... Uh, See if there's any voltage. No, nothing. No DC voltage at all. This thing is deader than a doornail. What is going on? Okay, well, I've been yammering on without the camera recording. <laughs> uh, but basically, let's go over that one more time. That was my rehearsal, I guess. But I have checked out a lot of the diodes on the board, and they all seem okay so far. But for doing a little research, it turns out that these ICs here can also cause problems. One of them is this one that I'm focused on here, the TD, TDA 60, uh, 4605, TDA 4605, which is a kind of a controlling circuit for switch mode power supplies. That often goes bad, as does the optocoupler up there, which I don't remember the uh, part number for off the top of my head. But yeah, between those diodes and those two parts, and maybe a voltage regulator as well, or a MOSFET. It seems like those are my next best culprits in terms of trying to get this thing fixed. 
Now, I don't have any of those spare parts on hand, but I do have a spare entire analog board that I can pop into this thing because I rescued another Mac Classic with a broken CRT not long ago, I was maybe a year ago or so, and I salvaged all the parts out of it except for the CRT and brought that back to eWay. So I do have a spare analog board, but it could have the exact same problems with the diodes and stuff. So I'll check the diodes before I put it in, but I figure we may as well try that and uh, at least see if we can get any life out of this thing. All right, got everything connected. The analog board, this other analog board is connected. It does, this one also does not have a speaker. I think I had to salvage that already for something else. So I'm just gonna go ahead and plug in the, uh, the uh, headphone jack here. I think you can hear the bong through the headphone jack. I don't know with a classic. But yeah, let's give it a try. Plug in the old power, see if anything blows up here. Okay, power is in. Let's hit the switch. Oh. Yes, there's something happening, but it doesn't sound good. <laughs> so it sounds like this analog board is also having trouble. It's kind of starting, trying to start up, but it's jittery. Uh, again, I didn't check it for cracked solder joints yet or other things, so it's definitely trying, but not quite getting there. So I think I am going to have to order some parts and move on to the next Mac Classic and see if that's in any better condition. Okay, looks like this one is also missing all of its screws. So this is starting to feel like actually someone kind of knew a little bit about what they were doing, or at least about what they were getting into. By the way, these were both manufactured March 1991. Hopefully that focuses on that. But yeah, if I open this one in the analog board and things are, are still disconnected, if the connections are disconnected, I'll know why. It's because somebody didn't wanna go through the pain or, or maybe stop short of going through the pain of troubleshooting those analog boards. But let's just see what's on the inside of this one. There we go. Okay, this one has everything connected, including the SCSI drive. And it also looks very good. Not seeing anything disconnected or problems with it. So, but there's gotta be something, right? Now we know that other one was bad or it has a bad analog board. I bet this one does too. Let me just check the fuse on this real quick cause I can reach that. Yep, it's got a good fuse. Something just broke off and dropped down in here. Oh no! It's the CRT. The little nipple on the back of the CRT broke. Dang it. Ah, oh, that's too bad. So this one's gonna need a new CRT. Ah oh, man, I'm glad I looked at this before. I, I was just kind of straightening up the, the, uh, the neck board here making sure that it was straight and it, I heard a little crinkle. So I went to take it off to see what was going on. And yeah, a little, little nipple. I don't know what you call that. I call it a nipple um, that's on the back of the CRT came off. Oh, what a bummer. It also had some hot glue, some hot snot around here. Well, what I could try to do is take this analog board and put it on the other classic and see if this analog board is working. Why don't I do that? I'll, I'll disconnect this one and, and see if that'll work on the other classic. And by the way, here's the system board for this classic. Uh, looks different than the other one. It's got memory. I thought memory was built into the other board. Maybe I'll take these off just in case I glossed, completely glossed over that. Uh, but this does have a PRAM battery, so we'll take that out and uh, get rid of that. Might be okay still, but it's gonna be long in the tooth, so probably best to get rid of it. And I have some replacements that I can put in there. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't look like there's a lot of leakage, just some, there's a bodge, blue wire bodge there. And then on the back, there's a bodge here with a resistor. So again, if I can get this thing working, I could swap this board in uh, for the other one, just to make sure that the board is good. All right, well, I've got the analog board from the other one, the second one that had the cracked CRT tube all installed and everything looks like it's in the right place. And I thought the speaker issue, I thought there was a wire for the speaker, but maybe not in the classic. The empty uh, uh, 
pin socket that I found was actually for the fan in the other one. So I figured that out and uh, connected the fan up to this one as well. So yeah, I think we're ready to give this thing a test. This board keeps popping out. There we go. There we go. Here goes nothing. Firing up the old power button. Well, it's kind of doing something. It's not working, but it's trying to power up the SCSI drive and it's cycling on and off, trying to power that up. So again, another bad analog board. It's the third bad analog board. <laughs> They're all bad, oh my word. Okay, I've unplugged the SCSI drive just in case. I don't think that's gonna help anything, but just in case that was somehow drawing a ton of power or something, I don't know. It's a shot in the dark. I'm gonna go ahead and hit it one more time. It's not the SCSI drive. It's the CRT. The noise I was hearing, you probably, you probably can't hear it and I don't wanna put my mic down there next to the high voltage, but it sounds like something revolving, but it's not. It's the CRT trying to start and it can't start, so it's cycling. Wow, bummer. All right, well. I don't know what else to say for now. I'm going to order some parts and continue to work on these probably in the next episode of Retro Hack Shack After Hours, but I think I have three bad analog boards. Man, I guess these things, I read online people were saying these things are really junk, the, the uh, analog boards, because this is the cost-reduced version, and they, they use cheap parts and uh, you know took out the dedicated power supplies that were in the SEs and the SE30s, and so... Yeah, apparently these are uh, pretty crappy. Welcome to all things Scottish. If it's no Scottish, it's crap! <laughs> and I would agree with that after having tried three of these. And it's no wonder that somebody took these apart, you know, looked at them, tested them, basically like I did here, put them back together and, you know, said, forget it, I'm taking them to e-waste. <laughs> so, well, that's a bummer. But hey, I learned something. Macintosh classic analog boards are no good. So I'm gonna order a bunch of replacement parts and at least see if I can get these working on an upcoming video. All right, so it's uh, cold here in the garage. I almost hate to say it because so much of the uh, country, it's winter as I'm uh, recording this. Most of the country is actually experiencing uh, really cold blizzard conditions right now. And uh, here in California, it's uh, down to 50 degrees where I live. So that's pretty cold. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we're spoiled here in California. Well, as promised, I am going to tell you now how much I paid for these. I did not get these at my usual e-waste place. I got them in a different place, which charges me a little bit more, but at least they're consistent. I got both of these for $25 each for a grand total of $50. Uh, not bad, considering that they are, you know, Macintosh classics. Um, you know, Macintosh of this vintage uh, often go for a lot more than that online. But of course, these aren't working. And now I know to kind of avoid these if I don't want to put in the work to fix those analog boards, which everybody says goes bad in one form or another, even if the caps on the main board are good, as I think these are. So yeah, 50 bucks, not too bad, not too shabby, but it is gonna require putting in some work to get these things actually working once my parts arrive. So until then, if you wanna watch more content about Macintosh, I will link to a video and you can go watch that and I'll see you over there in the next one. Thanks for watching everybody, bye. End of line.